All right, my name is Mildred, and we are going to look at how we can understand software development better, as that will guide us in our project and how we can think like a developer. We are going to make up a project on the fly and see how we can create that project that we will make up. Now, Flax is a flexible web framework for Python. And in this course, although we are going to use Flax framework, we are not going to use the features of Flax as much. We just want to have a framework to run Python, but we are going to learn more how to do things by ourselves, like creating our own functions and using Python itself. Um, and this way you will really understand how to use Python. The first thing you want to think of every time you have a project, let's say someone approaches you and says something like, um, they can't keep their work organized or they're running behind on all the work that they have to do and they just need to have an organizer or something and you want to just build them a one-page app for instance that they can use to manage and organize their tasks and let's use that as an example and let's try to build that in this class you want to think of several things for them to have a tax manager, they need to have a database and then a front end where they can actually enter the tax and then maybe mark completion status or keep tracks of the dates of the tax. Let's do it simple. Let's not make it complex. Hello, ma. Uh, yes. I can't see you. I can't see your screen. No, I'm not sharing sure screen yet. No, not yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. So let me just share now before we continue. All right. So we want to have that tax manager we want to build this we want to use flax um python to build this app we want to start up a basic app and to think like a developer first of all you want to identify the problem now the problem is we want something that can handle um organization of tax you want to have things that are completed things that are not completed you want to be able to handle that and you want to now think about what you need to do this you need a database and database needs tables. You want to think about what tables, what are the different columns and the different column constraints. When you think about it this way, it makes it easier for you because you are thinking about it in plain, in plain English. You're thinking about it in your language. You're not thinking about it in any programming language. Now, the next thing you want to think about is your stack. You're going to be using Python. You're going to be using MySQL. What dependencies do you need? We've learned so far, apart from those in batch C, um, that when you create a project when you want to use the database and connect um, to a database we use sql alchemy in this course right there are different kind of orm we use to create our models we need to have a model which is the database table and we want to use sql alchemy if we want to have a, a dialect or a, a, a driver we have mysql and let's say we want to use PyMySQL, then we need the framework which is flux and Flax needs Python 3 to be installed, which we all already have, right? And so these are the things we need. That's what we can think of right now that we need. Within all of these four dependencies, there are different methods and libraries that they have that we might use as we go along. What is the first step? We know what we need. The first step is to create the project folder and then install Flax, the framework that we need to use. We have learned also in the first week of um, part three that anytime you want to start building an app and you have dependencies it's always better to create a virtual environment you don't want to install things or library system wide so that if you have other projects the different versions will not conflict so you want to have a virtual environment that manages all that where you install all the dependencies for each project so the first thing we want to do is to create a folder in any directory of our choice and let's call this tax manager now we have this and we want to add this to our virtual, virtual studio code or visual studio code sorry we have tax manager and then we import that now we have that um, folder here for our project we've said that we want to have the dependencies installed first we want to open your terminal so we use the terminal here 
to make it uniform across different operating systems, it will be easier for us to just run one code instead of running for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. Um, if in the event you get or you run into problems with the code I'm going to run, you can research how to do it for your operating system or for your device. Okay. So we have this tax manager folder. And the next thing we want to do is to install dependencies. Before we start installing our dependencies, we want to even see if Python is installed. So we'll start with Python, Python 3 version. So you want to make sure you have like the most recent um, Python version or not too old ver version of Python. So I have Python 3.11. I think the most recent one is 12 or thereabouts. Um, so if you don't have Python installed, you want to head over to python.org and install, download and install a Python. So once this is done, the next thing you want to do is to upgrade pip. Pip is a packet manager or package manager for Python. And by default, pip comes installed when you install them Python. But sometimes you need to upgrade it. So let's do pip install. Upgrade. Pip. So this is done and it's the latest version. So we don't need to upgrade. The next thing you have to do is to create a virtual environment. Now, regardless of whatever project you are doing, this is the step you have to think about and follow. First thing is to identify the problem. Ask yourself how you want to solve this problem. Identify the functionalities that you want to have. Then start thinking in terms of the database and how the project is going to be structured. When you think about that, you now think about the dependencies that you will need to make to be able to use that database and all of the functionalities that you want to create for the project. So we'll create a virtual environment and we'll do that using Python 3, M, B, M, V. So this is the code and then you give a name to your virtual environment. I always want by convention my virtual environment to be named .v env. You can give it any name you want, just remember the name of your virtual environment. So I'm giving mine the name .venv. Once it's created, you will see it um, in your folder .venv as your um, virtual environment or whatever name you give to it. Now, you have to activate it before you start installing things within it. So, um, dot, if you do .venv, which is the name of my virtual environment, in your case, it's, it is going to be the name of your virtual environment, slash bin, slash activate. This might result in permission problems because I'm not running as an administrator, so permission denied. So to avoid this, you put dot, a space and a dot, venv slash bin slash activate. And then it's activated. Once activated, you must see your virtual environment in parentheses there. Is it clear so far? Yes. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Okay. Those in um, batch A writing your project, do you have, do, is this part clear? Yes, yes. it is. Yeah. It is. Yes. Yeah. All right. So once it's activated, you want to install your framework, Flux. Always make sure this is activated. If this is not activated, make sure it is activated before you start installation. Okay. So we install Flux by using pip. Pip is the package manager. So every time we want to install, we use pip install and the name of the package we want to install. So we want to install Flux first. So pip install Flux. When we install Flux, we it comes installed with other things like Jinja2 templates, which is what we're going to use to build our HTML forms. Um, so we don't need to install Jinja2 templates separately. And since this is not a front-end course, we're not going to go deeply into it, but you have enough information or enough knowledge to build yours. And for those in batch C from weeks 20, you'll be 1920, you'll be, um, you have a full lesson on that um, in your pre-recorded videos. So we have the flags installed. 
and we want to think about the driver that we want to use for my sql and let's say we want to use um, pi my sql for instance so let's install it pip install pi my sql so we've installed that and it's telling me to upgrade pip if i want to so you can follow this and upgrade your version of pip if you get this i tried upgrading before we started and it said it's the latest version so now i'm going to upgrade pip and it's successfully upgraded so we want to use sql alchemy as our object relational mapper so when we say object relational mapper it's just a way of having um using classes and objects to create our tables um we, within the we, i'm using python to create tables rather than sql and we're using classes and objects so sql alchemy is the, um, the object relational mapper that we're using for this course and we use pip install sql alchemy and so that is successfully installed so we have installed the dependencies that we know of for now while we start building or when we start building if we run into any problems or we need to install more dependencies we will come back and do that so now that we have done that the next thing you think of is your directory structure how do you want to create your directory we know that we want to have html forms and when you use flux you must create a folder and the folder name must be templates like this with an S. Flux will know to look at the templates folder for your HTML files. If not, it won't find it. If you want to have JavaScript or CSS file, you must use a folder named static. So it knows that it looks in a static directory to look for CSS and JavaScript files. If you decide to change this name, the, the whole thing is complicated to go into those kind of um, management, but it's just easier to just name your folder templates for HTML static for CSS and JavaScript. Now we have this, we want to have a file, which is the app file. And that file, we want to put that file in the roots of the application app.py and this is the file where we will run as a script to be able to start up the web page we also want to have a models directory where we are going to create all of our um, models for all the classes and methods for our database um, tables so now we have this directory set up we know what we want to do now that we have this, we want to think about how to, where things go. But before we do that, let's even look at what we call routing. In the app file, I'm going to write code. The first thing you do when you want to use Flux is to import Flux. So it's going to be from Flux, take note of the capitalization, import Flux. There's nothing serious to learn from this. Just know that anytime you are using Flux, this is the first thing you need to write. You always need to write this. So you can actually memorize it because this is all you want to do. And you always want to instantiate it, app, Flux, um, name, like this. This too, just memorize it. There is no special explanation to this. This is how you start a Flux app. Okay? Then you do all your imports at the top where you import all of the dependencies that you need. We also want to use SQL Alchemy. SQL Alchemy has libraries called Curate Engine and Text. When we use Text, we can run our SQL queries like we know them, um, or like plain SQL um, queries. And Create Engine is what we just use to create an engine when we want to connect to a database or to run transactions on a database. So I want to import SQL Alchemy again. So say from SQL Alchemy, import create engine, and let's import text. So we're just trying how to connect to the database. Now that we have the base code that we need to have on our file, the file that we need to run um, to start up the app, this is one 
paste thing that you need to have. I want to do something. Let's run this as a script. And when you want to run it as a script, let's say if name is equal to main app dot run debug equal to true. So just memorize this. This is basic. This is what needs to be on your file. All your imports at the top. The body of um, this has to come after the import. And after this, you have all of your other codes, your routes, and then this at the end of the file. So this is the part where we write all of our routes. And we'll talk about the routes shortly. We want to do something here. Let's look at how to do routing. But before we route, let's look at the basic structure of a URL. If I come to my web page, for instance, let's say I have a web page. Let's do this. Hello, ma. The school site. Yeah? yeah I, I want to ask a question here. Yeah. Now, the issue of entry points and routing. Now, for example, now I have a a maybe how do i put it now an e-commerce uh, website mm -hmm. and uh, let's look at another scenario where i have a form now in the case of a form and e-commerce i actually need the explanation of entry point and are they going to have the same entry point how do i know how many entry point i need to have in the area of the routing so when you talk about entry points, do you mean the, the page that everyone will see when they go to the site? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's what we are going to look at now. Okay. Okay, so when you come to a site like this, this is the site address, school.midriadgroup.com. Now, routing is when we have URL with a forward slash, we want to go to another page. We have a page called fees. When I put slash fees, I'll come to, um, this This needs an extension. When I put slash fees dot PHP, I come to this page. If I put um, another one, let's say the courses, we'll have slash catalog here. The same thing with routing. When we come here and we want to create the URL where the user will, that will be bound to a function that will run when somebody goes to that URL. We are going to use a route decorator. A app dot route. So this is a route decorator. And in the parentheses here, you put the route. As I have here, my route is now I, I'm using file extension, but in PHP we are not using the extension. So it's going to be like this has index. And index is either you put the forward slash index or just the forward slash. And because this is just the forward slash you know that when you want to go to the index page or the home page, it's just a forward slash here. Now, what this route decorator does is that it will bind to a function that will run once you hit that route or that, that um, path. So when I say, if I come to the index page, forward slash, forward slash, which means um, the home page, it should just show me hello world displayed to the page. So let me run this and see if it works. So I will start this and it says, hello world. Now, if for instance, I want to go to a page that says profile, I'll create another route for profile. And I will put a function that is bound to this. So let's say dev show profile, for instance, you can give your function any name you want and then let's just return something that will be printed to the page. So I will come back to the page here and if I put forward slash profile like I have in my route decorator, it should give me profile that I want it printed or I'll say this is my profile. And when I come here, it shows this is my profile. So you see how you do route. The route decorator will hold the route for the site, uh, the page that you want to go to or what you want the user to see. And the function here is what will be run when the user comes to forward slash profile on the site or the home page. Forward slash just means the home page. 
this just means another page of the site now before this will make sense we have to create a form and ask the form to run on this profile for you to understand it better but do you have a basic understanding of routing now everybody yes yes okay so we we know what it is to to route now there's another one url for but we'll not look at that today we'll look at it maybe we'll have a class next week and we'll look at that so you can understand routing deeply so we have this and we want to now start creating our html templates let's let's create a base file here let's call this base.html now the pre-recorded video gives a detailed explanation about this so i'll just type this without so we'll be fast so in the head area we want to put all of the meta tag let's do the head um i'll remove the title let me just do um close head let's do chassis first then let's have the viewport Mm. let's have the let's link to um let's link to bootstrap let me use bootstrap for this so I'll say link real i think this is it i think it should be this um let's use the js deliver cdn i'm not going to use this one I want to use 4.4.1. Okay, I hope this is correct. Um, I'm not doing anything special here. This is a link you get online, but because I've used this over and over again, I already know where what it is. But it's not something you have to memorize. Um, so that's for those of you who I have done front end and you use Bootstrap. Hmm. I don't even know what the integrity is. I need to get it from online. Okay. And then we have title block. There's the block title. So we use blocks for Ginger. And when I say blocks, I'll explain it when I write it. It will be easier that way. Hello, ma. Yes. Uh, why are we putting the the title in a uh, calibrisis is it a must it must be in that calibrisis yes if you are doing a base file that you want to import on other files now okay. the title tag right is what displays on your browser window whatever you have in the title is what displays here you see this one that ip address slash profile you want to see something like this sop online that is what we put in the title tag here now because this is a base file that we want to import on every different pages. If you put a name here, then one name will be on different pages and you will not know what page you are on. So we want to put this, this is a ginger um, syntax of writing. This is a placeholder that you create a block. You always use an, um, a coily brace and percent sign and you write a name, block, you can name your block, block title and end block title like this this is the syntax which means this is a placeholder so any page you go to and you import this file you can define what the title is so this like a placeholder the pages will define the title themselves now do you understand yeah yeah i get it now i get it okay now we want to let's let's stop there for the head and let's do the body part now for the body we want to Let's have a navigation. Um, let me get a file to copy this from so we don't waste time. I think I should have done this somewhere else before. Hmm. I will get a file to copy from. No, this is not what I want. Okay, so this makes it faster. So let me explain what is going on here. We have the head area where we put a placeholder for the title and then we have the body 
where we have a navigation. I'm using Bootstrap syntax. Since this is not a front-end course, I won't bother going into the details of all of this. Um, but for those in batch C, and I think batch B2, from weeks 24, thereabouts, or week 23 or 24 or 27, you should get um, lessons on this front end. But what this is doing is just creating the navigation bar on the page and putting the route for the pages. Now, because we want this to the home to go to the home page, the route we have for home is forward slash, and I use forward slash here. For the tax, my tax, I want it to be on the same home page. So I'm not going to have a home page that will say welcome and then I'll click on links. I just want the home page to display a form. Then I also want to have another route that will use to update my tax when I've done the tax. And I don't have a route for it yet. And I'm going, we're going to create that route later on. So this is what this is doing, the base file. Now we want to create the index page which is now going to be the page that will be displayed when we run the app file. So on the index page, the first thing you want to do is to import the base file that we have just um, created. So you use extend. Now I'm not going into so much detail because your pre-recorded video has the step-by-step -step basics that you need to know. Okay, so extend base.html and then I want to now, because I have a placeholder here for, for title, I want to define the title for this now. So I've imported the base file and the title is home. So let's say the title, so the name is block title, so end block. And then in the base file here, we have block content. So this is what will differentiate the content of each of the different pages. So this is the placeholder for the content. Now that I've done the title, the next thing is to do the content. So you see on this page, index page, I don't have to write all of the HTML code anymore because I have a base file that has all of the HTML template code and I have a placeholder for the title. So things that should change from page to page should have a block type, the block like this. You name your block. So this is the block for the title and this is a block for the content area where the content of the different pages will be different. So this is the basic you need to know about um, the Jinja template. Um, syntax. There are many other ways to use it, many things to do with Jinja. You can do block style sheets here, block scripts or JavaScript if you're using custom scripts in, the, in different pages. But this is the basic. Let's keep it basic since it's not front end. So you have a block for the title, we have a block for the content. And then we define the, the title here. So this is the index page. So we'll just say home and then we now put the block for the content and put everything that we want in the content area here. So what we want to have in the content area is a form. So I'm just going to um, create the form. So I'm using Bootstrap styling. Um, um, you don't need to know this. It's not part of the course. I just want to I just want us to have a look and feel that looks okay. Um, let's see. Let's let's create a header. And let's say here will be. Um, let's use H3 tag. Welcome to my tax manager. And then I want to have the body now. Okay, so within this body, I want to create the form. Let's put some um, page five. Define your tags below. So now let's do form. Now, when you create a form, we have HTTP methods. We're only going to look at the get method and the post method. When you want to just display a blank form or you want to search something that is not sensitive, your method will be get. Get can be bookmarked. You can, um, it displays on the URL, whatever values you're sending. 
you use posts to send sensitive information like form values. If you are filling in a form, you need the value not to be able, to, you don't want the URL to be able to bookmark the values. You want it to be secured. You want it um, to, to not um, have it displays in the URL for people to see all of the values that you are sending. So post is what we're going to use to submit form values and we use get to retrieve um, just an empty form or a black blank form or if we want to retrieve any information that is not um, sensitive we use get so we use post now the action attribute will specify the url that we want to the url we want to process this form now in our app file we have a url forward slash we are going to change all of this but for now let's just write this that we want it to be processed by that forward slash um the function that is bound to this route forward slash for the form we let me just create the style for the form so you don't need to know anything i'm doing now apart from knowing the route for the action attributes so if you're a back-end developer and you create your back end um, you have really have no business with the front end we just mix front end for those who want to see what it is that they are doing um, you just need to create the function at the back end the front end developer will know how to put the attributes and deal with the methods um, you need to know the method get and post okay so all of this part that i'm doing right now is not extremely relevant for the course but it's a knowledge that if you have it might help you okay so let's have so the name attribute is what we want to take note of my name here is tax name i'm going to copy this and just use it for all of the different form fields i want to have another field called um let's say description So the tax manager, we want to have a form that the user can enter all of their tax that they need to do as they think about it, just as a tax organizer. And then they'll be able to update which one is completed, which one is not completed, and different dates that they want to have the tax done, um, the deadline and what they expect to get out of the tax, just like leaving a note like an organizer that you want to have. So I will have description for it. Um, let's say because description, let's use this as a um, text area instead of input. So the ID here is going to be description. And here will be, let's change the name to be description. Okay. Then we have another one we want to have let's put like a intended start date and end date and then let's have something like the deliverable what we expect to um submit as a final requirement from that tax so let's say the this will be start let the input type here be date let's just use date and let's say start and then let's do the same thing and let's say end then we want to have one more for the deliverable so this is just basic it will just do something to help you guide you in thinking so let's say deliverable deliverable and let's say describe your deliverable okay let's just stop here now one thing we want to take note of that we're doing here is we are creating this form but when it comes to creating the database for this form we wouldn't have more form fields than the fields that we have here we have more database columns than what we have here and we want to think about what these columns will be like we want to have a column tax name we want to have a column description start date end date and deliverable but we want to have something like tax id we want the back end to auto generate tax id you don't enter it 
we also want it to timestamp the current date at the back end has the created that date so you see the extra columns we are going to have on the database table when we create them um, or when we create the table we'll use a single table for this um, so we'll have the created at which will be something we'll timestamp at the back end and then we'll have the tax id which we will auto generate um, maybe a random code at the back end and then we'll have those two columns along with all of the columns that matches all of these fields that we have here so we'll take note of all of the name attributes the values for the attributes are tax name description start date end date deliverable we know these names we want to add tax id created that and maybe updated that to the models so now we want to create the models before we create the model let's even see if this form is going to display properly on the page let's um put a submit button um i'll use the input type okay we have this so for you to render a template here we have a method that we need to import from flax which is render template render template and so instead of saying when we get to this route here we instead of saying return hello world we want to return render template index.html so every time you want to display your form or your an html template you are going to use the render template method and then you are going to pass all the function and going to pass the name of the template which is index.html there and so let's try to run this page again i'm going back to my url here and let's go back to the index page with the forward slash and we have the template here so we have all of this and the submit button um i think i did the submit twice sorry so name is equal to submit so when i refresh this we have that so you can see we have a form and we can actually um, enter things so i also need to change here from tax to be start date and here from tax to end it so do you now understand how to display a form on the page or a template any html file on the page yes okay. yes i do all right those in batch c you understand or well, i know it's going to be a little hazy for yeah. batch c um but um you're going to rewatch this video after you get to week 20 and it will make more sense but you need to have a head start before you get there so we have render template i'll just delete this and index file and we can see the form displayed um, according to what we want so now it's time to enter information here and when we enter information here we want this information to be sent to a database we want the database name to be tax right let's use utf8 unicode ci so you remember how to create a table you can write the create um or create database sorry you can write the create database table um, um statement sorry and put in the character set and collection this dashboard helps me just select it so I'll create a database called tax and it's tax database we want to connect to so the next thing we want to do now is we have the index place we are rendering the template but this is not going to work anymore when we want to collect information so we're going to change this the route decorator needs to have the methods and the method we want to have is both get and post why do we want to have both get and, get, get and post? When we have a blank form, somebody comes to the index page, we want it to use the get method and render this template. Get method is always default for every form. So once no button is clicked yet, it is the get. When we click the button, the method we have on our form is post. So when we put this method get post here, we are using one route to do two things get the form fill it and then submit the values you can have different things you can make your life more difficult and have a route for get a route for post 
and do things like that. But majorly, professionally, you want to have a method that handles both. Now, if you have a method that handles get and post, it now means you are going to be returning two things in an if condition. Now, I want to say if the submit button is clicked, when you click this button, submit button, the method for that form is the post method. It means that it is going to send a post request. For this, we need another method from the Flux library called request. So we have request, and so we want to say if request dot method is equal to post. Let's just pass for now. So if the request method is post, you pass, else we'll do something else. So if the request method is post, we want to do something, process, collect all of the data from the form, process it. But if it is not post, we want to do something else. So we'll say return mm -hmm. render templates index.html. So in place of this pass is where we will put all of the things that we need to do. In place of this pass, we'll put everything we need to do when the form is submitted. So the syntax, when you want to display a form, if no value is on it, and you want to use the same route to process that form if values are entered and the submit button is hit, um, especially or particularly if the request method on the form is post, the method here has to be post. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be post for all forms, but because we are using get and post and we are saying if the method is post for this form, because when we hit the submit button, the request method is sent is the post request method that we use here, which means that it is going to run everything in this if condition. And if the request method is not post, it means it is get, which is a default. It is just going to display the form on the page. So now we have successfully used this route to do two things. We are using it to display the form when it is empty, and we are going to use it to process that form when values are entered and the submit button is clicked. Is it clear now? Okay. Sorry, Ma. I, I want to ask something. Yeah. Um, do we only do this when there is a form on the page? Or we always do this on the margin there's a form or not on the No, you don't need a post request if you are not submitting any values to the database. So, so if there's no post, it. yeah, you don't need to put a method if you're not submitting values or you're not doing anything that has to do with that needs some HTTP methods. So it's only the routes you need to have. If you are displaying a blank static page, you only need to have the routes. You don't need to get some post method like this. But if it's going to be a route that is going to handle form processing, you want to put the method both get and post. If because if that route is handling processing of the, the information on that form, you need to have both get and post. You want the same route to display the form when it is blank, you want the same route to process it when it is filled. But once it's a static page that does not have a form or doesn't do anything that requests that requires any HTTP um, request. You do not need any method on your route. You understand? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, that's okay. I think you are attending to a question. You say? Can I ask my question? Yeah, you can ask. Yeah. The if request dot method is equal to posts. Yeah. Um. It, 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 can we also include? Uh, yeah. It, it, will it be also okay if we say else return or we don't really need to put that no if you, you don't need to put the else return this is the same thing as saying else return this okay okay right. so this is the same thing like saying else return this but sometimes you want things to be more pythonic and more professional so you okay. remove things that are not necessary okay it's okay yeah so if the request is post what do we want to do you want to think about the form field the values that the user entered into this field, you want to take them, store them in a variable. Once they are stored in the variable, you want to be able to insert them into a table. But we don't have the table yet. All we have done is create a database, but there is no table. So how do we create our table now? So let's um, try to create our model. 
and we'll go to the model directory and we'll create a file let's make this file um let's just say tax.py now we have this we want to have um different classes that hold the names of the table in this situation we just have one table we want to actually get a base model and we want to be able to have all our table names convert to um, lower case um, make it easier so there is some there's some basic inputs and some basic things you need to have we need to have a base model that um, inherit from the declarative base class uh, you don't want to go into that just memorize exactly what you need to have there um, from SQL Alchemy so we want to import all of the things from SQL Alchemy that we need to use um, the first thing we want to import is um, the different column names we want to have we want to have date time column for the created that we want to have integer for maybe our tax ID we want to have string for all of the other values that we're going to type in there okay so let's say from SQL Alchemy we want to import date time we want to import integer we want to import string um, let's say we want to import Let's stop here and let's say from SQL Alchemy dot ORM we want to import the maps column what we use to map um, our column names to our ORM to the class name. So if we want to have a string, we're mapping the string str that is for Python to string of SQL Alchemy. So we're going to use the map column and then we want to import mapped then we want to also import declarative base we want to import declared attributes um, decorator from the declarative extension so let's do from sql alchemy dot extension dot declarative import declarative base so no we don't want to import this we want to import declared attributes yeah this so these are the basic imports you need to have so just memorize that you need to have these imports when we want to build a model also when we are building a model sometimes you want to have your columns optional you don't want it to enforce a not null constraint you can also import from typing so typing is the module where you import the different um so you can import optional if you you are doing um type hinting then you want to import the all the other different types python types so we want to import optional so that we can have optional columns so we have the optional the map column the declarative base the mapped we have date time integer string so we have all of this the next thing you want to do is to create a class the base class which is going to inherit from the declarative base and when you do this just pass these are just basic syntax you just need to memorize them don't bother yourself trying to know everything about this then we have the let's create a class for the base model and We'll use the decorator declare the attributes. Um, you can watch the pre-recorded video to get a detailed explanation of what this does. But um, this is something you want to memorize to just know how to use it. Okay. Now it's time for us to de define our class for the database table. So we we'll have class. Let's say the name of this is tax, since the table name is going to be tax. We want this to inherit from the base and base model so it's going to inherit this base and the base model here now we want to define the table name 
The table name is tax. Oh, let's say tax with X. We want to now start putting the columns. So ID, we want to have a primary key. We'll say this is equal to um, maps column once it is an integer. When we do this, we want to have it like, so for the ORM syntax is to have the name of the column and then you are mapping to the data type is int, right? And then this will be equal to mapped column, the function that we imported and then we are mapping this to integer primary key is equal to true. Okay. Do you understand it now? So we also want to have um, the created at next. And let's say this is mapped. Let's say map string. Sorry, this is not a parenthesis, this is a square bracket. So this is map string is equal to let's map this to date time and let's leave it like that so let's have the tax id let's this be the map string also Let's make the length two five five, um, and let's make sure it is unique. Unique equals to true. Then we'll have the tax name with the same thing. Let's have the tax description. Um, let's make the description optional, and then let's make the start date. To be date time, and let's put the end date to be date time. Let's put the deliverable to be string, and then let's make the completion status because we want to be able to organize tax, right? So we want it to have um, the completion status to be able to for the user to be able to mark in progress, completed, delayed, or anything we want to have there as the status. And then let's say updated that. So this is basic. This is not what you will do. This is not how your columns will look for um, production ready development. But we have to start small and then move um, ahead. But this is almost basically um, everything you need to know about how to create your models. Um, when we have multiple tables, you will now have to start using foreign keys as um, most of you have, have already seen in the pre-recorded video. So what you need to know for the model is that you just need to have this import and you need to have this. If you are using foreign key, you are going to um, import your foreign key here um, from SQL Alchemy. But if not, this is just the basic you need. You need to have these basic classes, um, the base class that will inherit from the declarative base um, class of the SQL Alchemy ORM and then you want to have your tables created in classes like this. So the name of the class will just be, you can just match it to be similar to your table name and your table name is what is here. Then this is the place you have to focus on your column definition. All of your column name, a column, you are mapping to what data type equal to map column and the SQL Alchemy type integer for string is string and for date time is date time, like that. I'm mapping string, but I can map this date time instead of string, date um, instead of string. But let's keep it simple. Let's move on. Now we have done all of this. The next thing you need to do is that on your app file, you need this file to run. You want this to be created once you Once you run that page, you want the table to be created in the database. So when we come back to the app file, what we'll do is to, we have uh, the import here. Sorry. Can you hear me? 
Yes, ma'am. I want to ask a question. Yes. So, when do we need to include the colon created at and um, um, updated at and the ID as well? Because they are not in the form. So, I would like to know when do we include them for a model or okay. what tables? For all your tables, you need to have a primary key. You can either make your tax ID a primary key. I like to have just an ID column that is done index for the table. And I will always set this to, let's set this to auto increments to even make it um, better. When you have that, you want to set it to auto increment. Um, hold on. So we'll set this to auto increment equals to true so that you don't have to put any value in it. Right? So you want to always have an ID for all your tables standard if you don't have an id and let's say you want to use the tax id as the index you need to set it as a primary key and maybe if you want it to automatically insert values there you put auto increment which is to put like a serial number one two three now created at you need to time 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 stamp everything that goes into your data um, table the time it was inserted or the time it was the record was created updated at again the time it was updated so these are things that you need to have and basically you always have uh, created at um, created by which will stamp the name of the logged in user so we are not doing login register so we don't have that so for every table you create you want to have id you want to have created at timestamp if it's an updatable table you want to have updated that also so you want to have id created at if you have a login register system where a user logs in before they perform that operation, you want to have created by and updated that, updated by. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So we have this. We want to make sure that this is created and we'll come to our app file. On our app file, we have the import for Flux and the import for SQL Alchemy. We said we want to automatically generate or randomly generate a code for the tax ID. So for this, we import random. This is a library or a package that we can use to do, to um, create random numbers or to generate random numbers. Okay. Then we want to import the model we just created. So let's say from, let's just import models dot um the name is tax let's import models of tax has tax let's do that like that and then we want to timestamp the created at the updated at let's import the time so i think these imports will suffice for what we need to do so we've done all of this it's time for us to say what is going to happen when the submit button is clicked so once that button is clicked, if request method is equal to post, we want to have a created at, which is going to be datetime.now. We are using this datetime we imported. Okay. We want to have the tax. Now tax will now be equal to, all of these are variables we are creating. We are making them hold the values from the form or the auto-generated values that we are generating now. So the tax is what is filled in in this field. Tax name, called tax name. So we have to guess the values from this and refer to this name. So tax is going to be equal to request dot form and the name of that is tax name. So get the value entered into that form field with the name tax name. That's what this means. Okay. Then we also want to get the description. The name is description. Um, let's see. And we have the name here is start date, end date, deliverable. Okay. So we have description. Let's say start date end date and deliverable um, so we have it um, all collected so now we've stored all of the values from the form field in a variable 
we have not done the completion status and the tax ID are things we want to do generated automatically here. Let's say we want to have randomly generate tax ID. So we have we can do random dot run it like this. Um let's say let's make it a number, let's say hundred thousand. So you can put any figures here to see where your to to define where you want to start between within a range of numbers you want to generate your random numbers from. I want to just generate this. Um we have enforced uniqueness on the definition of this um to make sure that the tax ID is unique. So if it's not unique, it will give an error and you refresh again to make sure it is unique. So we get a tax ID and now it's time to insert all of this into the database. So let's put completion status and put a default value. Um, let's put it like not started yet. So the user is going to be able to change this um, on, in an update form from not started to in progress or to completed to remove them from the list. So we have the completion status not started and we want to now connect to the database and insert into a table. So now we have not connected to the database here. We want to do that. We want to say, anybody with question? Yes, ma'am. What about the updated at column? The created at column, updated at. Yeah, is because here we defined yes, the updated as as um optional, or we have to make it optional because we are not going to insert any value into it until when it's time to update. So we don't have to put anything. So we have to make it optional so it doesn't error out. Okay. So it's optional, and we are not going to define anything for updated at until it is actually updated. So the first thing we want to do with our insert query is to put a timestamp of when it was created. And then when we are writing the route for update, we'll put a timestamp for when it is updated. You understand? Okay. So we, we have done this. We want to connect to the database. So app.config We have um, SQL Alchemy database here, right? Now, this is the basic thing you need to know. You need to have a connection string. I'm going to use the format string here just so that it will be easier to write this. You can have a format string or you can just write it in quotes. We don't need a format string. We're not even putting any variables here. You want to put a connection string that consists of the name of the, the, the type of um, database management system you are using, plus a dialect, which is the PyMySQL that I, I imported for the driver. Then a column, two forward slash. The username is usually root, except if you created a new user the column, the password for that user. So when you use MySQL Workbench, you have a username root and a password that you created. You put the password there. If you don't have any password, just put the forward to forward slash. If you have a password, you put the password before the forward slash. My, I didn't set a password for mine, so I'm going to skip the password. But password usually comes after the column here, before the double forward slash. And then I have sorry it's not double forward slash single double forward slash you put your password so wait, let me go back again the name of the database management system which is a mysql we're using and plus the dialect which i want to use by mysql a colon double forward slash the username which is usually root a colon the password and after the password you put add if you don't have a password leave it blank just go to add then you want to put the host, which is usually local host, and the ports. If you if you are not using the default MySQL port of 3306, you want to specify your port. I'm using a default MySQL port. There's no need for putting that port. Even if you put a column and the port number, I'm not using it. Forward slash the name of the database. 
my database name is i think it's tax right yeah my database name is tax so you have already done this string and this should connect to the database um, if all is well so you need to have app.config my sql uh, my sql alchemy database URI is equal to your connection string then you create the engine so engine is equal to we use the create engine method app.config this so you're going to create engine in the parenthesis you just put this here or you can do it one time instead of having app.config equal to this you can do engine equal to create engine and put this in the parenthesis one time so we've gotten this done let's say echo equal to true let's look at debugging also we've done this and the next thing we want to do is to run the model to create that table so we have imported the tax here and we want to import um so we want to import this base so tax dot base so let's say tax dot base dot metadata create all engine so this is going to create all of the tables in this model file we only have one so it's going to create the tax if we want to run a query like create table if not exist we can use check first equal to true to make sure it doesn't create a table if the table already exists so you don't have errors that holds the system so this are the standard or the basic things you always need to have when you want to connect to sql alchemy using sql alchemy to connect to a database this is the syntax you must have this there you now create engine the same way and then you run this whatever you import here your models file you imported dot base dot metadata dot the create all um method for the sql alchemy um engine check first equal to true so you just need to know that this is what you need to have to connect to the database so what you want to do is you don't need to memorize these things you need to know exactly what to do you can have a file to say um, when I want to, when I import flags, I create an object and then I use that to start configuring or doing the configuration. And I want to connect to a database, a database, I will just write these two lines of code. It connects to the database. And when I run this line of code, it runs all of the table in the models file or whatever the name of my file is that I imported. Um, and listed here so i put import this as tax tax dot the class name there base and we use check um create all which means create all of the tables on that file when you look at the pre-recorded video it also shows you how to create one table at a time if you want to if you have one file that has 10 tables you don't want to write 10 lines of code to create all the tables you just want to use create all one time so we have this let's even see if this works uh, i'm not sure if we have any error but you've done this and you want to now connect to that database and insert into the table tax that we have created okay so this is going to create a table the table name here is tax with an s um let's look at this is going to create a table tax and we want now to run this by saying with engine dot connect let's use has con or as connection whatever you want to put it as we want to have con dot execute we want to insert into tax table created at tax id tax name the name the different column names we have description so let's look at our column names we have the tax id tax name description start date end date deliverables completion status updated at we're not inserting into this we're only inserting into created at tax id tax name description start date end date deliverable completion status so we've done that so created at 
tax ID, tax mm -hmm. name, description, start date, end date, deliverable, um, completion status. So the values now, we are now putting these mm -hmm. values of the variables that we have here. So if you look here, we put the, we use just the format string method to be able to use, uh, insert the, the variable names as the values here. So it can pass this um, into the database table. So once you do this, we must commit the transaction. Even though it will succeed, but it will not go there. So let's say con dot commit. So if we have done this, all is well, we should have whatever data we filled in entered into the system. So let's refresh this page and see if it will work. So let's enter a tax. Let's say the tax name is um, grid. Let's say organize cost materials or grade 10 science. Let's say grade 10 biology. And the description is look at the curriculum. I'm just leaving a note to myself and make an outline of all outstanding work and let's say the start date um, we want to start this on Saturday we want to make sure it ends by Wednesday and the deliverable is um, course outline calendar and event schedule okay let's just do something like this this is what i want to do um i want to have this tax i thought about it i'm not starting the work now but i'm organizing my thoughts and what i need to get out of this so i have this and i want to submit if all is well we didn't do any validation or any messages it just clears the form but let's go back and see the table we have the tax table and we have the data inserted in the tax table so everything we typed in has been inserted and the created that you can see Edmund is timestamped with the exact time that I just inserted this here. Okay. So I put the start date and the end date here and now the deliverable and everything is here. So the next thing we want to do is looking at how to retrieve that value into another form to be able to update because now we have completion status not started. This form doesn't hold that completion status. It's the update form that will hold that for us to update that value. When we want to get the value back, that is when this tax ID that we auto-generated becomes useful to know what row of information we are updating. Does anyone have any question? Nothing so far. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this is the way you think about programming. You think about the problem. You think about how, what, what you need to solve this problem. Do you want to have a database? You want a form? What are the form fields? What do you want the user to do with the form? When the values are entered, what do you want to do with the values? Do you want to be able to update these values to retrieve them for updates? What are the fields that need to change when, um, or the updatable field? You plan your model, you connect to the database. Now let's review again. You have your template directory. The base file is always like a file that holds the basic template code that you will import on all other templates. The index file that I have here is just my template that links to the um, index page. I can have more templates. I can have profile.html and I want to run that template whenever the profile um, route or whatever the name of the route I'll put is hit. Now, when you put route here, you have to put, the route is just the URL that the user goes to or the path of the URL that the user goes to um, and the function that will be run when they go to that, what will happen? Do you just want to render a template or you want to just display a message to the page. Now, when you want to process a form, you need to specify the methods. If the same 
route handles, display of the form, and processing that form, you want to have both the get and the post method there. And when you have both methods, then you want to use the if or a conditional statements to say if the HTTP method is get, you want to render the form. If it is post, you want to do something with the values. The first thing you want to do is under normal circumstance for production, you want to sanitize the inputs, make sure there are no scripts, there will be no attack. Then you get those values, sanitize those values. You can write functions to pass these values through to sanitize them. And then you now begin to connect to the database to insert into the table or to update or to run whatever query you need to run um, against the table using those data and that is the end so if you have you want to display a message you want a success page to come in here you can render a different template or, or write a message that will be displayed somewhere on the page um, you can create a part of the page that receives the message if you want to but we're not going to that detail today um, I want you to understand this now for the purpose of those in course batch C and also for those that um, complained about not understanding functions let's look at functions um, properly and the next week we're going to look at how to update this um, for those who have projects to submit um, to use to verify last minute um, your work. So we'll look at functions. Um, I think for course, for batch C, you are doing higher order functions this week. And let's look at functions in details so that you can understand what a function is. And and for everybody, I think most of you from future, but from earlier batches also have problems with functions. So now we use all of these dev hello world this is just creating a function in python i'm going to stop this and i will just create a file we'll use to illustrate functions so we can have deeper understanding of function so i'll just create a file here and i'll just name this file functions that's why now when we want to have a functionality that will be used over and over and over again every time you want to do this particular tax you don't want to have to come and start um, writing the same code over and over again you want to have a function that you just call and perform the tax let's say for instance I want to have a calculator app for instance and you know that when ever someone is using the calculator they can continue to add let's say the person wants to add several figures from a ledger or something and they'll continue to say one plus one plus two plus three plus four and keep clicking that and you don't want to write code that will continue to run all the time you want to have a function that is just called to do this thing in python we define a function using the dev keyword like this and then a name for the function you want your function name to be descriptive you want to have an idea of what it is the function is doing and then you're going to put the name um, to just match what the function is going to do let's say um, or to even make it easier maybe we'll do a function I was going to create a function that is going to insert record but it might look too complex for basic function okay let's say we have a function that will just display a text when it is called receives an argument displays a text when we have a function let's say greet like this and then we say print hello world like this whenever we say greet it is just going to print hello world for us to see here so this function does not take any parameter in the definition when you have anything in the parenthesis it is the parameter for the function but if i say i want to have a parameter which is name and i want this to print according to the name of the person print hello 
put the name of the person. Then when I call Grit, I have to put the name here. So let's say Grit Mildred. And when I run, it should say Hello Mildred instead of Hello World, like that. This is called a parameter when it's in the function definition. But when we call the function, it is an argument. Okay, sometimes we use it interchangeably, but if you get confused about what is an argument, what is the parameter, the parameter is when it is in the function definition, an argument is when you call the function and you supply the arguments for the parameter, or the value for the parameter is the argument. Is it clear? Yes, it is. We have something we call positional arguments, and we have keyword arguments. Keyword arguments are things that the arguments have a name. Positional argument is like this. So let's say I want to put um, first name, last name, right? And hello, first name, last name. When I greet here, I'm going to be supplying first name last name and so when i run i will have first name last name printed but in the events that i have a specification that the last name must be printed first and we call this function like this with my name first name last name it prints first name as last name and last name as first name in that event, you need to call your argument with what we call key, keyword argument. So now we can say last name is equal to Smith and then first name is equal to Mildred. So this, are, this is what we call keyword argument. It helps you to specify things without having to keep to a particular order. Because now it knows that this is the last name, this is the first name. It is going to print out um, correctly with last name and first name. So it's going to print out hello, first name, last name. The order here, um, the, the order it prints out is first name, last name as I wanted here. But when I said greet, I did last name, first name. If I change this to last name, and here to first name and I run this it is going to print last name and first name in the correct order how I want it because I'm using keyword arguments but if I have last name first name here and I'm not using keyword arguments I'm using positional arguments it is going to print this out in the order in which the parameters are defined so if I put here um, Smith Mildred by the time I run this, it is going to put hello Mildred Smith. Even though I put my last name before first name, it is going to be displaying this in the order of the definition of the function. So we use keyword arguments when we want to prevent this kind of problems from happening. You want to, you want the users to specify um, values without having knowledge of the order in which the parameters is specified or are specified in the function definition. So keyword argument just means you use a keyword to specify them. So this last name. So all of your, your values have a name or a key and first name. So now when I print again, it's going to print it in the correct order because now the function knows that these arguments are in this order um, based on the keyword arguments that we use. So is it clear now? Does anybody still have confusion about this? It's clear from my side. Okay. So this is it about um, functions. This is the one of the basic things you need to know about functions. Now we have been working on creating our project, but we are not looking at how to handle the errors that might occur and what it is going to display on the page for us when we have errors. On this app file, we have tried to do things like this that might fail 
And whenever you have code that might fail in Python, we we'll use a try except block to wrap around the things that we need to, the code that we need to run that has the possibility of failing when we run the code. Now, when we look at this, we are not handling any error. What if an error occurs? We'll get this cryptic um, message that we might not be able to interpret or we might interpret it, but the users will not be able to interpret what it is. So one thing you want to do is you want to have a try block and within the try block, you want to put all of the code that might fail, which is this, which are this code. And then if it fails, we want to say accept. And what is the exception we want to run? Let's just print out the message. In for production, we are not going to print out the message. So we want to say accept exception as E. We don't even want to do it this way. We might want to say, um, you can have custom exceptions also. Like in Python, we have two types of errors. We can have syntax errors, right? And then we can have logical errors. When we have syntax errors, it's like, um, when we put things in the wrong place and the, the whole syntax is wrong, we don't do things correctly. But when we have logical errors or exception is when the syntax is correct, everything is correct, but something in the logic fails at um, runtime. So for instance, when we say, um, an, ex an example would be like division by zero. When we say 10 divided by zero, the syntax is okay, but at runtime it discovers that you are trying to divide by zero. And then it gives you this error saying division by zero error. Um, it gives you that error message to the page. So you can have, there are different custom errors Python have um, or Python has, and um, you can refer back to your pre-recorded videos to look at our error handling topic to see that. But what you do is always wrap things around try except block to see how it um, handles the error. And sometimes you might even know the exception in advance if you know a lot about the different errors that um, Python might, the custom errors that we have, like we have value error, zero division error, but we don't know what error this is yet. And we just do this to print out what error, whatever error we get. Let's try to get an error. Um, let's say tax name is required and we don't have tax name. Let's remove tax name. Let's get an error on tax. So we're going to get an error here and let's start this. Okay. So let's enter something. Let me just write some default values. Okay, so this went through. It didn't get the error um, that we wanted it to get. Um, we didn't have the error displayed here on the page, but let's look at the here if the errors were displayed here. So we have the error here, but on the page, we didn't have any cryptic mes message telling us anything. But here we can see the error here that we have field tax name does not have a default value because we wanted this error displayed. Um, like that. So it handled the exception. We didn't have everything crashing and failing there. Has it mean we have no, um, we don't have this here. The, at the front end, we might find the code being cryptic. Let's say we have, um, let's say print something like your column names are incomplete. And I come here, submit. Now we'll not have this inserted in the table because it is wrong. But when we come back here, we'll find our error here telling us your column names are incomplete. So it's handling the error without having to crash the system there. And another thing you want to do is we want this thing to be displayed for the user to see that this was not successfully inserted. So we're going to do that in next week's lesson, but um, this is just an example of how we write our um, code to handle errors. So for those in batch A, writing your fi fi final project, you want to make sure that there's er error handling included in your um, code um, everywhere that you are writing code that might fail, especially when it's going to be doing any database query, inserting, updating, um, selecting, 
you want to use it um, you want to use a try except block to handle the errors or to raise errors that um, will be displayed for the user in plain text like this and not the cryptic message that we saw the first time um, saying all of this on the page okay you want to have just plain errors like this for the user to see so we are going to go deeper um, into this and for those of you that will move over to an advanced course we are going to write our code in more production ready um, way um, so does anyone have question anybody with question all right so in the absence of question this is where this lesson ends i will try to get the video out before the weekend is over for you to be able to follow through all right thank you everyone and see you all next week thank you